Welcome, of course, good morning, and um, we, are, we are delighted you're all here for the 33rd annual Familial Dysautonomia Day. And before I'll, I'll start, I have a number of things to tell you. I'm going to show you a video of um, Sue Slagerhout, you all know her well. Uh, Sue couldn't be here and send, a, I think, uh, a very expressive and, and um, useful video, so I will show you that before uh, talk. Good morning. I'm really sorry that I can't be with you in person today, but my daughter Emily is graduating from high school. She's headed to nursing school at the University of Pittsburgh, and I couldn't be more proud. It's really hard to believe that so many years have passed since I stood before you on FD Day and spoke to you while pregnant with Emily. My message for you today is one of hope. Things have never been more exciting for FD. It's been 18 long years since our hunt together for George, and many of you were with me every step of the way. Science has advanced remarkably over the past several years, as has our understanding of the FD gene and how the mutation causes disease. This means that finally, therapies are on the horizon, but we can't get to the finish line without all of you. There are teams all over the world working to develop therapies for FD, and you'll hear about some of these from Frances today. Her work with Mike Brownstein suggests that an, that an existing drug might help FD patients. We recently published a paper with Dr. Pagano from Italy showing that we can modify U1, an essential component of something called the spliceosome, and correct the defective splicing we see in FD. Adrian Craner just published the fact that small oligos can do the same thing, similar to one of the therapies that's on the market already for spinal muscular atrophy. We recently showed that Kinetin can correct proprioception in an FD mouse, and our work with PTC Therapeutics to develop a splice modifying drug is going extremely well. Of course, Horatio, Lucy, and Albert, and the whole team at the FD Center continue to work together to learn more about FD, and they work all the time to improve the lives of FD patients. So what do we need to get all of these potential therapies to FD patients? We need you. We need all of you. It has never been more important to get involved. Science can only get a treatment so far. It must be tested in people for safety, and it must be tested in patients to see if it works before the FDA will approve it. Do you know that there are therapies on the market for dozens of rare diseases? The only way that happened was through clinical trials in patients. And for rare diseases, that means everyone needs to participate. So every time you hear about a new therapy on the market for a rare disease, remember, that it only happened because all of those patients participated in clinical trials. So help us spread the word. If you have friends in Israel, tell them what's coming and get them excited to participate. If you have FD friends that don't come to the NYU Center for their care, that's okay. We need them too. Help us spread the word. Remember, you are part of the research. You always have been. It's a team effort. And the only way we'll succeed is as a team working together. Get involved and help us get others involved. On behalf of my entire team at Mass General and all of the scientists working on FD, thank you for your support over the last 26 years. And thank you for everything you do. I've never been more excited for FD than I am today. I hope you enjoyed the day and I hope to see all of you again soon. So as, as, you, as you know, it's the 33rd uh, annual FD Day, has a long time, has kind of, and it's actually my 11th, so 33rd and 11th. Let me start with the, with the statistics as we, Felicia used to do, and I've been doing again for, for so many years. There were last year, seven, nine, 2017 and 2018, there were five newcomers there are, uh, there's one young, delightful little girl in the US. There are two um, siblings in Canada, new ones, and two in Israel. So five newcomers, and we hope that um, 
life for them is going to, to get better. That's, that's our, our goal. Uh, there were also six deaths last year, uh, six very um, loved members of the FD community, Lee Berkovic, she was 847, Ruben Gerstenfeld, whom I met uh, repeatedly in, in Argentina, who married and, and, uh, and had a very, very fulfilling life, age 43, Scott Fass, whom you all know, he was 37, Steven Schwartzberg in Canada, age 35, Lisa Gross, age 23, and Xcock Klein, age 15. So each of them is a, a source, continues to be a source of inspiration for us, and not only this is a celebration of their life, I want to tell you and emphasize to you that we, we learn from them, and in the same way that we, we learn from everybody, because you see, in, in simple terms, the, the mission, the most important mission of the center, of the Disautonomia Center at NYU is actually to learn, and to learn how to do things better for people with FD. That's the, in one sentence, what we're trying to do at the center. And how do we do that? We do it through studies. That's the, the only way that we know how to do it. We are the people of the book. So there are essentially two types of studies, right? Uh, broadly, there's one type of study is the observational studies, and those essentially we watch and, and collect information in detail, and the other type of studies that we do are the so-called interventional studies, in which we apply a specific treatment, either a drug or a device, something that uh, is supposed to improve things. So what, what are, let me explain you a little more in detail what these studies are, what is that we do. Observational studies, a way to call them, have been going on at the center for the last 50 years, right? The center started almost 50 years ago. And these types of studies allow us to understand how familial dysautonomia evolves over time, how things change. So this is called, in, in medical terms, this is called the natural history of a disease, or the natural history of FD. And this is very important. How, how is this done? Well, we collect observations, we collect data of everything that's related to your health, from clinical to imaging data to laboratory data, during the yearly visits, as also in between, every contact that you have with, with us or with Erin or Christy or Alberto or myself at the center, all that in addition to what happens in other places and all your laboratory data is stored and entered into a big database that was specifically designed for this and is perhaps the, one of the most, if not the most important tool that the center uses to follow what happens with everybody with FD. And it allows us to do a number of things, this big database. First, it allows us to do real-time analysis. What does that mean? Well, we can check trends in when they actually happen on the lungs, the kidneys, the heart, the circulation, everything that happens with each of you, we can follow it and see it live uh, exactly as it's occurring. We can also understand the outcomes of what we do, meaning each time we use medications, either old or new, we can see whether these therapies actually help patients. And then the third, and perhaps uh, the crucial or most important goal of this database is that we can learn specifically what worsens over time. Now, what, what does this mean? Well, it means that we can identify specific symptoms or signs that get progressively worse regardless of what we do. And the two examples are balance, the ability to balance when walking, and vision. Now, when we see how these things worsen over time, we can also use them as targets of potential treatments 
When we see that something gets progressively worse, we can apply a treatment and compare what happens without treatment to what happens with treatment. And it is against this benchmark that we compare every new treatment, and I'll show you that in, in a second. The, this database also help us, and this following, these observational studies, also help us learn a number of things. And I will give you just two examples, or, or three examples I think I have here. One is the work of, of Alberto Palma uh, over the last few years. This was uh, recently published, and it's a case control study showing the risks or the causes for sudden death during sleep in people with familial dysautonomia. This was a case control study, and you can read it. I'm not going to go over the details now, but it, what shows you here is that we compared people that had one outcome during, during night and other people that didn't have that problem. By comparing a number of variables, we were able to learn that uh, non-invasive ventilation like CPAP or BiPAP uh, decrease dramatically the risk of these events at night. And we also find out that the use of fludrocortisone actually made things worse and actually depressed respiration in the same way that Valium did. Similarly, also with data from this database, uh, the work spearheaded by, by Lucy initially was seeing that Florinef and other drugs that increase blood pressure too much actually made the development or the, of, of renal failure much faster and that these drugs should be avoided. We also, based on data from the uh, database, in big part data that was available from there, is that Dr. Kasaskov and a group of other experts of the center and outside the center were able to produce these respiratory guidelines, meaning a set of guidelines that tell us how to treat respiratory problems. And Dr. Kasachkov will, will tell you it, it, things in, in details um, after, in, in a few minutes. Now, so this is in general what natural history studies are. I want to tell you that these are ongoing things and that we are constantly entering and analyzing clinical data. And this is critical for improvement. If we don't see and constantly reanalyze what we do and try to understand things, there's no way for improvement. Now, there are also ways that you can help, and this is also what Sue was emphasizing, and I'm, I'm just giving you two examples of how you can help us treat you better. One is what soon will be available, and, and Hilda Maybeck will, will talk about this today, is the ability to use an app that you can have on your phone called FD Connect, and you will be able to enter data every day, how you're feeling, and other things that are happening to you, and that will be fed directly to it, also to a database that will allow us to follow you also in more detail, even when you are at home. Another important way that you can contribute, and I'll show you that in a few minutes, is donating uh, a small sample of blood, not only you having FD, but your parents, because together with PTC, this pharmaceutical company, I'll show you other things in a minute, that is developing this new kinetin. They, are also, uh, they also develop a new and an accurate method to measure the level of the protein in blood, the defective protein called ICAP. So we need to know how this varies naturally. So it's important that we increase the number of samples from you and from your family. So these are two ways in which you can contribute. So these are essentially the observational studies, the ones, the natural history studies. The second type of study I was referring to are the interventional ones, when we apply a specific treatment. Now, when it can be a drug or a device, and then it's important or it's, it's what, what we do is we measure whether this treatment improves a particular feature. Now, there are two rules, of course, to when even before starting, 
Number one is do no harm. We have to be certain that this is not going to make things worse. And the second important thing is that one should change one factor at a time to try to understand the effect of that change. So broadly speaking, and this is where I'll show you one example of each, these interventional studies, when we do a drug, these clinical trials, can, um, we, can, we can test three types of drugs. One common are the, and, and the ones that you know or understand better because intuitively we can understand them, are drugs that do symptomatic relief. Right? If you, you have a problem, they are supposed to fix it, to fix the symptom and make you feel better relatively fast. The second type of drug are those called protective, that could, could protect a complication that we know may occur. And finally, the most exciting or the most interesting are the ones called disease-modifying treatments. And those are drugs that could directly modify the cause of the disease, like the genetic abnormality. So starting with symptomatic relief, the intention of these drugs, as I mentioned, is to treat the symptom, for example, the nausea or the retching uh, during crisis. Now, as I mentioned again, it should make you feel better or make the problem less severe, and it should happen right away. So, to test these drugs is relatively easy, somewhat straightforward. Now, uh, how do we do it? Well, we identify a problem. The medical team and, and the, uh, the basic science team identify a symptom and a possible treatment. We select patients that we believe could benefit from that treatment, and then we need to compare the effect of the active agent of the real compound versus another at the time that patients receive a treatment or a drug that is actually a sugar pill or what's called a placebo. So by comparing the effect of both agents, we can be certain whether the drug works or doesn't work. So measuring those symptoms, you see if the active agent was better than the placebo. So this one is relatively straightforward and relatively fast. The second type of drug are those called protective drugs. Now, the intention of a protective drug or intervention is to reduce the risk of developing a known complication, something that the natural history showed us that will always happen that inexorably occurs, we want to see if by giving a drug we can prevent that from occurring. Of course, you, you should realize, and that's the difficult part to explain many times, is that these drugs may not make you feel better right away. That's not their goal. Their goal is to protect or prevent something from occurring. And one of the complicated issues is that they require a long time of follow-up to see, and sometimes it can be years, whether the outcome is actually better. So two examples of, of these protective ones are a drug that could protect for the development of renal failure. That's something that was occurring, is still occurring, but was occurring at a much higher rate. And the other one is coronal opacities. So we identify a problem and we also identify a possible solution in the, in, for renal failure was decreasing the variability of blood pressure and for that we use carbidopa. And for corneal opacities we use scleral lenses. Now we, we have to measure the outcome of, of these two interventions and see after a few years, and those things are still ongoing, whether the actual intervention is slowing or preventing the problem. Finally, uh, in, in addition to, to the, the symptomatic and protective, the ones that are most interesting, as I was telling you, few minutes ago, are the disease-modifying agents. Now, the intention of these drugs is to correct the underlying cause of the disease. Now, this one not only might not make you feel better right away, it could even make you feel 
bad initially, or it could have side effects that each time we have to decide whether they are worth it or they are not worth it. If you know that some mild side effects you could pay or tolerate if you know in the long term that this will work. Now these drugs, of course, they should stop, they should slow, or in the best case scenario, they should reverse the abnormalities of FDs. Now, these drugs are not, not only they are not easy to develop, they are not easy to test. And they are not easy to test because they require a very long term of follow up. And they also requ require a very clear and granular understanding of how the disease progresses over time without medication. So that natural history, what I was mentioning to you before, is very important to know how it occurs so that we can see whether a disease-modifying medication is actually doing the job that it's intending to do. So how does this pipeline work? Well, basic scientists and a medical team, like what you heard from, from Sue, find out the cause and try to investigate, investigate what's the cause of the disease. In the case of familial dysautonomia, it's a specific genetic mutation. You find strategies that may fix that abnormality, and those are tested in animals, in animal models, or in cell uh, of FD patients in cell models. And then once that occurs and a candidate drug is identified, the next step is to get pharma to get pharma to actually produce something that is a crude concept into an actual pharmaceutical grade drug that will produce what we tend to do. In the, so pharma will make compounds that are usually are significantly more potent and that are safe also for human use. And then the medical team has to identify a specific outcome, something that will be measured when this drug is given. We have to have something very clear and measurable that changes over time and can tell us whether the drug is working or not. So then, based on this, you organize a clinical trial, you find the patients that could benefit that have those problems that could benefit, and if the drug is effective in the worst, in the best possible scenario, and there are no side effects, you make the drug available for everyone. Now, let me finish by telling you what's in the pipeline for familial dysautonomia, and I will just give you two uh, examples. There are more things and I'll mention them. I, I will give you some details on one which is a symptomatic drug, a drug that we, are, we, we plan to use and that hope will reduce symptoms, symptoms that are very distressing, and another that is a type of genetic therapy that should be disease modifying. Now, both of them, of course, have to be uh, tested quite uh, differently, right? Um, let me first tell you the one on symptomatic relief. There is a, this drug is called, has a, has a very fancy name, almost like a new car model, right? This SRX246, right? Sounds like, like a new Mazda or a, is a, is a V1A receptor antagonist, a big mouthful. What, what is this, this drug? Uh, actually, it's a new type of drug that blocks a specific receptor for vasopressin hormones. The type of receptor is called VV for vasopressin 1A. Now, we know that uh, vasopressin is involved in um, the, the control of, of sodium and, and blood pressure, but in addition to that, it's also a transmitter in the brain. Now, these receptors are in brain areas that are involved in fear and emotional responses. They are also in brain areas that where the autonomic activity originates, where the fight or flight response 
uh, the tachycardia and hypertension of fear is also originates. And also, there are these receptors are in the stomach when they alter gut motility. Now, we know that some familial dysautonomia patients, in fact, a large number of them, when they have crises, they secrete, and we measure this repeatedly, they secrete high levels of this hormone, and we, we don't know exactly to what extent, we know just some details, these high levels of vasopressin contribute to the symptoms of crisis. So there's a possibility that blocking these receptors could decrease the symptoms of crisis. Now, the drug, uh, this SRX246, is, we, is, uh, is being developed uh, in a company that um, is called Azevan, and Mike Brownstein is, is, uh, is part of that company, so he made the, the compound available. And um, now the drug is being, is, we know it's safe in humans, because it's being tested in anxiety disorders like post-traumatic stress disorder, and two months ago has also been the type of drug, not this, this one specifically, but the, the uh, type of compound has been declared a breakthrough treatment for autism. So when FDA declares this a breakthrough treatment, does not mean that it is actually a, a an effective treatment. It means that it has that potential and they will help in expediting the need for treatments and clinical trials. So the, the drug is quite exciting. We, are, we hope to be able relatively soon to start a very small trial uh, with what's called N of one studies in which just a few patients will receive it and they will be monitored very, very carefully for uh, side effects or effectiveness. The second type of drug I want to, to tell you about is something you've been hearing about, right? And I will call it superkinetin. You know, you heard about this. This is the, sort of the new name we, we give to why we call it superkinetin. Well, we know that kinetin, and you've been hearing about this drug for a long time, it corrects the genetic defect of familial dysautonomia and raises the level of the defective protein. You know that the, the, the mutation of familial dysautonomia makes the, the synthesis of this protein called ICAP or ELP1 it makes, it blocks in, in a way the synthesis of the normal protein. So we know that this kinetin fixes that problem. We also know that raising the level of the protein can reverse some of the features in some of the features of the of in an in an animal and cell models of if they can do what we call rescue the phenotype. If kinetin is given early enough and, and in, in adequate doses, you can reverse some of the abnormalities that are present in the embryo. Now Kinetin itself is not potent and is really a crude drug. Uh, the, the interesting thing is the, is the concept that what it can do. The drug, again, is not very potent and is not well tolerated. So as I was showing you before in that pipeline, here is when pharma comes and we are lucky to have a company like PTC that is building a new compound based on the old kinetin, but altering that structure and doing a much more potent compound that should have also a better access to the brain. So what are we doing? Well, we're preparing for this with a very detailed natural history study where we think we can find the targets. So let me show you, and I will I assure you, these are my last slides. Um, how we're going to try to measure that, and this is this is very preliminary. So, we, as you all know, coming to the center each time you will come into the center, your eyes are looked at, and we take these pictures of the retina. Now, using this OCT machine. Now, all that information is stored. As I mentioned to you before, and you, you, you see, it's stored in this big database, and for years we've been storing that. So let me show you 
what happens with the, with the retina? This is the thickness of the retina. This is done, uh, I'm sorry, this is work done by, by um, the Carlos Mendoza originally, originally but it's now uh, Isabel, whom you all met, that um, kept this, the, going with this work and put all this data together. <clears throat> so what you see here, this is the age of the patients, and this is the thickness of, the, of one of the layers of the retina. And as you can see, it starts here, and each of these is, is one patient, and it progressively goes down. That means the thickness of the retina gets progressively thinner and thinner and thinner. And as you can see, the decrease is much more pronounced in the first decade, then it decreases a little less and almost gets to a plateau here. So why is this important? So let me show it to you a little bigger. So the natural history shows us that that's the way in which the retina evolves if we do not do any intervention. That's what happens with the retina in FD. So this is two alternatives I'm going to show you of drugs that could potentially work. If a drug is relatively effective and it delays progression, if this superkinetin delays progression, we expect that by delaying progression, instead of this worsening being so steep, it will be around there. And if instead of delaying progression, it actually stops progression, we would hope that it goes like that and that it actually doesn't decrease the thickness of the retina, which is destruction, progressive destruction of cells would not occur. So in order to measure these, we, we needed to have years of measurements to collect those measurements and see if by doing a, a, a direct intervention we can modify that, we can reverse that course. So there are, we, are, we are lucky because in addition to this that we've been working for many years, um, FD is receiving a lot of attention now thanks to, to the work of everybody uh, in which the, the possibilities of fixing problems are there. Here we have, a, we have a, a disease with a specific problem we understand and potential ways to, to fix it. So one of them, and, and Sue also mentioned these, are these new compounds called antisense oligonucleotides that were developed by Adrian Craner. You remember he spoke to us uh, a few years ago, uh, one FD day. So these antisense oligonucleotides are now very hot in, 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 neurodegen in neurology because they are a, apparently effective treatments for other neurological diseases. So it could, the same could perhaps be applied to FD and certainly in an animal model that's happening. There is another possibility which are these, this is also worked by a big team and Sue Slagerhaupt is part of that also. And these are other compounds called exon specific U1s or uh, small nucleotide RNA that could also improve or modify the genetic defect. It, there's a third, even a third method. Remember for so many years there was nothing. There's, there's, a, there's a third one also um, it, for investigators in Denmark showing that these silencers, these splicing, splicing silencer compounds can actually reverse the genetic defect and they were used in uh, cell lines of patients with familial dysautonomia. Finally, there's another very interesting compound called BGP-15 uh, that was tested and studied in detail um, by Francis Lefcourt, and you will hear from her today, which is another very, very interesting compound uh, that could, could fix uh, some of the mitochondrial abnormalities of FD. So it's, it's likely that we will need different therapies for different stages of the disease, we, we learned that it is, is important to, to preserve function 
and to, to stop decline, that, that would be uh, certainly a worthwhile goal. And if, if, it's, if it's possible, of course, we would like to, to reverse damage. So, look, we, we think it's a type of hope, it's a time of hope. We, we, we want that to be the, the, uh, the, the message, and, and we want to tell you that we are hopeful. We think that advances are being made. Uh, we understand the disease much, much better. The last 10 years has seen a revolution in what we understand uh, on the disease. So I want to encourage you to be engaged and to participate, and that bringing new treatments into the clinic can only occur and can only happen with your active participation. And if it's not now, when? Right. Thank you. So before leaving the I'm, before leaving the podium, which is what uh, I essentially initially thought that I was going to do, uh, Lucy told me to do the distinguished awards now, so that uh, then I don't interrupt the two presentations. So I'm going to do this. This is the most I we believe is the most important part of FD Day, and Lucy wanted to do it first or early. So this is the, the time we honor individuals with familial dysautonomia for their accomplishments. Uh, there been, these are the past awardees. I will not read them all, but as you see, these were people that received those awards in the past. Um, the first uh, distinguished awardee of 2018 is Michael Baranov. You know, Michael, Michael is the Michael is the James Dean of the FD crowd, right? For for us, Michael is not only he's as good looking as as uh, James Dean as he puts in this picture. He's really a firestorm, right? He's a, he's a rebel without the cause and with the cause. I mean, he's always rebellious. And that's why we love him. We love Michael, particularly when he's wearing the leather jacket. I don't think he's wearing the leather jacket today, but he has a fantastic jacket. Uh, he's, he tells us that his family is very important, and he's really a big brother. Uh, he literally has hundreds of siblings. Uh, he will be graduating from Winston Transition School. He works as an intern two days a week. And he knows that having FD can be tough sometimes, uh, but you can get through it. And he tells us never, never give up and keep that leather jacket and that smile. Michael, we love you. Great. Um, our second uh, 2018 awardee is Ravid Mendelevich. I don't know if Ravid is here. Um, she, R R Ravid, R Ravid is a is a is a fantastic young woman. Uh, she's always happy and joyful, and in fact, she's described as a joy to be around. She's studying and teaching at California State University. She's really passionate about her work with uh, special needs children. She's a tutor for elementary school children. She loves to travel. She frequently goes to Paris, London, or Israel. We hope to receive more postcards. Uh, but we know she's always traveling. And she's always looking for opportunities to help people. She tells us never to give up and always do the best you can. Ravid, this is for you. <laughs> Our distinguished FD kid of the year is a fantastic uh, kid called Sam or Samuel Cernovitz. Uh, Sam is a, follows a illustrious tradition after Jack Posnack, uh, the next fantastic winner is Sam Cernovitz. Sam, <laughs> Sam, 
Sam, Sam is, a, is a fantastic, extraordinary third grader. He loves writing. He receives two Pride Po Awards. He did not miss a single day of school this year. And we are incredibly proud of him. Uh, he's, he's brave. He loves playing sports. He, this year, he went to overnight sleepaway camp alone, and he behaved perfectly. He's bright, he's extremely kind, and he tells us that having FD is okay because you can get tube snacks. <laughs> you should always try new foods, and you should work hard. Sam, you are a big star, and we are all incredibly proud of you. Our distinguished FD teen of 2018 is Jackie Goldberg. Jackie, Jackie is a star. She, Jackie is an all-around star. Uh, she's a graduating high school senior. She volunteers with special needs kids. Everybody loves Jackie. She's a member of the stage crew for, and has been a member for the last four years. She has been accepted to Moravian College for the next year. And she tells us, don't let your weaknesses define you. Use them to make you stronger in other ways. Jackie, you are the best, and we are not only uh, delighted, but we are we are honored to be able to see you and treat you and be be close to you, Jackie. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, that was it for the farewell. Let me just uh, introduce the 2018. I'm sorry, speakers. Um, that, that date is wrong, it's 2018, it was too late that night when we were doing this. So, uh, Dr. Kasaskov, you all know um, Mikhail, or Dr. Kasaskov, he has made incredible differences in our treatment of FD, and um, he's, the, he's the head of pediatric pulmonology and a professor at NYU. Um, Again, he needs no introduction. Mikhail, come and thank you so much for, for coming and talking to us.